Welcome to Catholic in America. Today we're talking about atheism. And today we're going to cover what is modern atheism and how does it affect our society. Also, why is it so appealing, especially among young people today, and what is our Catholic response to it? So stay tuned if you want to find out what Christopher Hitchens now knows. Welcome back to Catholic in America. Today, guys, we're talking about atheism. Please like, share, and subscribe. Okay, so a little bit about what atheism is, uh, who are some of the characters that are involved in the new atheism that we face as a society? I mean, some of the main characters in our modern society would be people like uh, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, uh, Sam Harris, uh, I'm trying to think. Dennett. Dennett, Dennett yeah. was one of the guys, yep. yeah. All people yep. who say, I mean, Actually, one of the actually pros of the new atheism is this notion of I can be a good person, I can be a moral person, and I don't need God. As well as that there's no evidence, there's no proof for God, there's no ways of actually knowing this, as well as that, or some actually believe that there's proofs against the existence of God, and therefore it is irrational to believe in God. It's irrational to hold that. These are archaic fantasy stories. These are like, why, why should I believe in centaurs? And why should I believe in God? <laughs> so... Yeah. Well, and it's also a way of freeing society of religion, of not having to, you know, deal with these kind of social constructs that comes from religion that informs people in ways that they're doing things, maybe things that they, they want to do that they're not supposed to do, just simply because religion says we're not supposed to do it. But there's not a real reason, at least in their mind, that that we shouldn't be doing these things. One of the popular things that came up, especially, and this is where the new atheists, not that new anymore, right. um, some yeah, of the Chris Richens has died, in case anyone <laughs> is wondering, pray for his, his soul, um, is after 9-11, the attacks on 9-11, on motivated by, by religious extremism, by terrorism, um, is this statement kind of of like that all the the wars in the history of the world, this comes up a lot, you see this online all the time, all come from religion, all the problems in society, all oppression, all darkness, all violence is, is linked to religion and linked to uh, this manipulation, this opiate of the masses um, that we call religion. And, and then the new atheists hit, ring that bell over and over and over again. Right, well, and there's also this idea of, of you know, reject the materialism that happens in religion where we're willing to sacrifice particular things because it may not be the best for us, it may not be good for us, but really in a materialistic world with, without a God, the, the opportunity to receive those things that, that maybe religion calls bad as good and to be able to use those things, to be able to be rich without having to feel bad about it, being able to have particular things in life without having to feel bad about it because somebody else doesn't have it. Sure, and also obviously pleasure. like. Uh, in, in our life, we only have a limited amount of time and that there's no certainty about whatever happens next or if that nothing happens next. And therefore, let me, accum let me accumulate the most amount of wealth or things like that as well as leave for my descendants as well as I want to have as much pleasure in this life. One of the things that, as far as what atheism believes, and I think most people's exposure to atheism is probably on something like, like YouTube. You know, something that, that's kind of, I always joke that people, um, you know, they watch half a YouTube video and they, they, they they believe this now, you know, so, so, but or this, Reddit, Reddit, or, or Reddit, 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 Reddit is probably yeah. the, you know, the, the large thing, but understanding science as a philosophy, which is, which is kind of a, a, in a sense, a sort of modern turn that science now becomes not just a way that we explain phenomena in the world and that we can manipulate phenomena for our own benefit of um, inventions and other things too, which I'm totally in favor of or in right. favor of the scientific method, but science no, as, as the only way of describing and understanding truth, that all truth is that which can be scientifically proven and in a sense reducing uh, all, all truth to that. I think that that's a major part of this as well. Right, that we're able to test things, that we're able to test what we see, feel, taste, and touch as opposed to those things that are not material. Yeah, yeah, which is materialism or yeah. a materialistic worldview. The only things which, is, which yeah. is real is that which is scientifically verifiable through the scientific method. So this is something that's, obviously it's not new. Atheism is not new. There's been atheists from before the time of Jesus. There were atheists in Greek oh, yeah. times. There were atheists <laughs> in times of the Lord. Um, there's atheists who, you know, show up in, in, in the Bible. You know, the fool's, fool says in his heart there is no God. You know, so there was obviously people that said that there was no God. Um, so these new manifestations of it uh, kind of bring up 
in a sense, maybe the newest, the newer aspect of it, like an evangelical atheism, is what, I, what I've heard it call, called. Yeah. In a sense that people want to proselytize, they want to, they see how religion has dominated society for a very long time, particularly in the Western world, Christianity. So how do we, uh, how do we undo well, that? It, is, exactly. by, is by, is yeah. by sharing our, we were, our, yeah. our lack of faith. If that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. yeah, I think that also is important to recognize the activism. Like now, there's an, there is an activism which is present yeah. within. Uh, a lot of the uh, atheist movements today is that like, we actively have to promote this. We actively have to convince as many people as possible, and uh, which is I don't I don't really I don't know really too much maybe of the history of the atheism in the 1700s, but there didn't seem to be as much activism as there is right. Well, it seemed to be today. more more of a, in academia. It seemed to be more of a subject that was held in universities and in philosophy itself, but not really in in common society. And that is coming into to society itself and saying. This is the way people should think. It's a way of freeing ourselves from religion where we don't have to live by these things and we can live a naturalistic life. Yeah. So why do you think people and, and, and are attracted to this? Why is this such a, a prevalent uh, and now acceptable sort of way of believing, of casting off uh, religion, of, of professing your atheism, um, agnosticism, atheism, you know, and whatever shifting gradations of that there might be? Why, why do you think this is so prevalent today? Well, I mean, you know, just putting it in the in the realm of what seems to be the most important thing going on in our society right now, which is the topic of sex and how that works in society, is sex in the the idea of Christianity itself or in religion is, is restrictive to a certain extent, and within a materialistic world, within a new an, an atheistic world, that really all those constructs are gone. You don't have to live by a certain morality. What your morality is 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 an acceptable form. I think it also like so sex causes atheism is basically what we're correct. Okay. <laughs> it's the root of the <laughs> maybe for some. No, I think that also like if you go back, this is not something which is new. This is something which is kind of been building over time, and that's why we're seeing also it, it's kind of snowballing, and getting bigger now. But I think that it also goes back to like philosophically, like going back to the ancient Greeks, because in ancient Greece, it was actually a insult. It was a derogatory to call someone an atheist, because the ancient Greeks, who were not Christians. Um, predominantly pagans, um, but who believed in the gods and their system of the polytheistic um, system, or even like Aristotle and Plato, who didn't necessarily ascribe to the polytheistic system. Um, Plato, though, who goes extensively against atheism in many of his stuff, because it's like you reject the traditions of all before, but there still seems to be like this primer, primer movie. It's so like in the ancient world, like the, ter the, t the term atheist was always used in a derogatory. You're not smart. Like it was actually kind of the exact opposite of what it is today is this notion of people who challenge what came before and challenge the notion of the gods or the divine or the logos and things like that. But what you've had in the recently, like in the past 500 years, and going all the way back to like the Greek model, the Greeks, and especially with Plato and Aristotle, they had this notion of reality and the study of reality, which was objective and which was the study of metaphysics. So the metaphysical realm, the objective of invisible and visible realities, which was metaphysics, was the overarching kind of school of, of philosophy. Underneath that, you had epistemology as one of the schools of thought. How do I know things? Okay. So you had reality, so being, the study of being, and, that, and within metaphysics you'll find ontology, the study of the orders of being, like a human being is above a plant and a plant, so forth. Like, so but, above a rock, maybe? Yeah, above yeah. a rock. Yeah, exactly. Well, actually, according to Aristotle, yes. yes. The, the plant has a... Animals above a plant. plant yeah, right. a plant has a uh, non-sensitive soul. Animals have sensitive souls. We have rational souls. So this notion of looking at, which is also the basis of biology, okay, which strangely is also science. Yeah. But so when you have that, though, there was always this notion of metaphysics, so the study of the visible and invisible world, which, which was reality. But then the question also would become, how do I know reality? thus the school of epistemology, of that knowledge, and therefore how do I come into contact with me the metaphysical realm, or how do I come and know what is real? But especially like during the Enlightenment period, you kind of had a flipping, where epistemology became almost the highest philosophy, that my knowledge of reality, right, so m what I know to be real, and therefore that's why like you have Descartes. Yeah, um, I think therefore I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think therefore yeah. I am. And therefore like the basis of reality becomes much more like epistemology takes on much more of a dominance as a, as a um, consequence of that. You're gonna also have the kind of the snowball of that with epistemology and therefore what I know to be true or what I know or what makes rational sense to me, this rationalism and so forth. 
Um, but this is kind of the consequence of this is like, you also have skepticism, cynicism, all these things, people who are challenging what came before, like even people who challenged, can we know anything? And therefore like I see rooted within like this new atheism is a lot of skepticism as well as cynicism of like, I can't know this, therefore it is not true. Mm -hmm. Or we can't verify this through epistemological, through the scientific method, therefore it is not true or it cannot be true. Well, and I think it brings up some critiques and one of the reasons why this is attractive is you see the abuses in religion, you see the abuses of power, abuses of knowledge, of, of superstition, um, all these sorts of things in a sense. So you can say like, well, this thing is bad in and of itself. And so I reject that. And so I'm gonna rebuild what I can. And so, so in a sense, it kind of, kind of is a rejection of, of, of religious thinking, understanding of God, revelation of all these archaic things. And I, that, that to me is, is interesting. Other societies, if something is old, it's better. And, yeah, and kind of this, this modern movement, right. if something is old, then it's automatically bad and is, and is automatically uh, should be rejected unless you can prove them for some reason that you need to hang on to it. Um, but otherwise, because, you know, because if we're coming from a scientific worldview where everything's reduced to science, I look at modern technology and it's better than technology in the 80s. And other than nostalgia, yeah. I don't want to go back to technology in the 80s. Yeah. So when everything's kind of viewed through that technological lens, it, it goes to ideas as well. But um, yeah, so, so I think that, that's one of the, the attractions too. Yeah, well, and, and, well and, 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 you know, piggybacking off of that, the, the idea of morality itself, it, it's almost seen now as weak and, and like you really don't have an excuse when you say that you're, you know, the, the criticism is is that you're only moral because God is. And that, you know, as a, as yeah, a person. Yeah, this, un, this unthinking, unthinking response to stimuli and reality around me. Right, exactly. My, my, my response to it should be because I'm a good person, not because God tells me to be a good person. And instead, so, so why do we need God to even tell us what really good is, what, what, what is moral? I do get, the, I mean, sometimes too that, that people say, well, you know, once I learned science, once I learned about the Big Bang or about Darwin, then I, I never, no longer believe in God, which is interesting. I think this will, our, our, our response and understanding of this as Catholics, we can get into it a little bit more, yeah. but to me shows that most people's grasp of faith or the way the faith has been taught to them is that you can't really have a, you can't really engage with science in, in any right. sort of meaningful way. And so it's much easier just to, to, to cast it off as like a fairy tale that I used to believe, you know, tooth fairy or something like that, you know, that God, Jesus is in sort of in that same category. And when you have that, it's very easy to knock down. I don't know, I also, but also another reason why I think that there's a growth in atheism is because, and this is one of the things that Pope Francis has been talking about, is that we need to be able to address the, th the three common questions. And one of the three common questions that all people struggle with is the question of suffering. Because there's a lot of people yeah. who have become atheists or who, had, who espouse atheism and this new atheism and in response to the question of suffering. Um, therefore, the question of why, does, why do these such suffering, whether it not be in the human experience, whether it be poverty, obviously abuse, like all the different uh, wars, things that we've experienced, as well as like just in nature, like naturalistic suffering, like pollution, uh, suffering of animals, like if there actually was a benevolent being, a benevolent deity, like why would a benevolent deity allow mm. for such rampant suffering to exist within nature? And even, I mean, there's even actually atheists that I know, um, good people who are just like, look at the violence in nature, in if such as like, look at, see what happens in nature. And if this is the actions, if this is the creation of a benevolent being, like, this is a horrible being. Like, why would I believe mm -hmm. in such like that? It's, it's easier for me to believe that there is not a being than to allow that there's a benevolent being who creates such horror right. in the naturalistic world. And that's like even the, the, the presence of the horrors of the naturalistic world. I mean, just turn on uh, the Learning Channel and watch like a, a lion rip apart a, a, a zebra and like as the zebra's screaming, they're like, this is the actions of a good God? Like, what, right. what are you talking about? Like, no, this is just nature. This is what it is. We're just pieces of nature. There is no God. Yeah, natural disasters, sickness, yeah. illness, diseases, and all that coming from what's called a good world. I mean, how could that be possible? Well, yeah. and, that's, and something that C.S. Lewis even talks about, like C.S. Lewis in his, in his uh, ponderings had a d great difficulty, like, why, with the question of animal suffering, yeah. animal pain, like, how do, why, why would God allow this to exist if he's benevolent? And I think it's important too to think, to see the shift um, of reading or hearing from people that have gone from a faith background to atheism, but also to people who've gone from an atheist background to faith. Mm 
Yeah. I think those we should be challenged by both sides of that. And, and wherever you know people that are watching today or listening, wherever you're at, if you're coming from a perspective of faith, if you're coming from a perspective of losing your faith or of atheism, to hear from kind of the other, the, the other side of that and to allow it to challenge us as of, of me as a person of faith, how do I, how do I, what do I take for granted that maybe is, is not evident to people or, or is, is more difficult or even painful for people, but also too for people who don't have faith to see that, that dangerous road towards that leads towards a belief in God. Um, so uh, with that, we're gonna dive a little bit more into how we are called to engage with this new atheism um, in the world online in our relationships. So we're gonna take a quick break and we'll be right back here on Catholic in America. Welcome back to Catholic in America. We're talking today about atheism. Please like, share, and subscribe. And please support us on Patreon if you enjoyed this. So we're, what we're gonna do, we're gonna kinda rapid fire this as much as possible, is some of the main objections that atheism brings up, which I think we need to take seriously, and what is our response to that as Catholics? So one of the first ones we'll start with is uh, atheism. Richard Dawkins is a great proponent of this. Um, against the indoctrination of children, the brainwashing of children, the warping of children's minds, and we teach them about God, something that we can't see. So how, how would you respond to that, Father? Um, I'd say, well, that's a uh, interesting interesting thing that we're not called to indoctrinate. Well, because can you flip the word indoctrination with teach? <laughs> so like, yeah. our, and like teaching children is extremely important. Like I teach my children to eat their vegetable. I, I don't, obviously not. Maybe you do because right. you're married. <laughs> you, yep. you taught yep. your kids that like yep. I have to teach them like what's healthy because like if I'm gonna yeah. if a child's gonna eat ice cream all day and uh, they're not gonna eat their vegetables. And so like teaching a child is important. And so like especially teaching them truth as well as helping them to separate fantasy from reality. Now Dawkins' presupposition is that God is a fantasy. Right. Okay. But that's a presupposition. <laughs> He presupposes that to be true, and from the perspective of a uh, of a theist who believes in that God is one and God is there, is also that like you also want to teach your children morality from an early age, and I also want to teach my children to be selfless from an early age, and that's why like I'm not going to wait until my child is 13 or 14 where supposedly they have cognition, right? <laughs> Supp supposedly. Supposedly. Right. Right. Father supposedly Tom, you, te can, you teach I high do. schoolers. I do, I teach. So, like, so, I've yeah. got a 13 year old. <laughs> yeah, man, so I'm just like, no, yeah. you, you're yeah. going to teach, because that's also the, the whole basis of Judeo-Christianity is that Abraham was called to teach his sons. The passage mm. of faith happens to children. That's what God commands, actually, is that a child is taught, because I can also tell you this, children know nothing. Like that's why they have to be taught by their parents. It's also why when parents neglect the instruction of their children, it's actually a evil. It's right. not a good thing to to ignore children and to ignore their instruction. And we know this in truth, and we know this is true in math. We know this is true in science. We know this is true in the humanities and English and language studies. And there's a presupposition I'd say on the part of Dawkins, obviously, is that he's well. You don't teach them about fantasy. Um, I th I th I well, and Dawkins actually wrote a book for children as well recently about how to in indoctrinate <laughs> children into a materialistic worldview. So it's, it is yeah, interesting. So you're gonna, uh, the child's going to be indoctrinated one way or the other or taught one way or the other. So I, think it's a, I do think it's a false argument. And if we're teaching children, hopefully we're living it too. And I think that, that's where the, the consistency Correct. needs to happen. All right, I got another one. So people are only good or only believe in God because they're trying to avoid burning in hell for all eternity. Yeah, yeah. So, and you hear this from quite common. I mean, you know, and I think some of it, some of the roots kind of comes from our own problem of, you know, Occam's razor of, you know, you, you want to believe this because if it's true, look what you inherit. But even if it's not true, look at the good life you lived and what have you got to lose? And so that, I mean, that kind of plays into some of it, but also the fear of what happens next. I mean, I think everyone 
has a, has a issue with what comes next after death, how I live my life, and, and, and then also areas of justice, you know? Can some, I mean, if someone lives a bad life, what's gonna happen at the end of time? I mean, there's, there's no ultimate justice to it. So I think there's lots of issues that go into it, but the, the real question is, is, I'm just trying to avoid burning in hell, so I'm gonna believe in this. I got my fire insurance, if you will. And mm. so believing in God is a way of, it's the opiate of the masses, I mean, it's the way of really Curing, you know, putting salve over that fear, that that constant struggle of when I die, what actually happens. And so, I mean, you know, in some ways, you can ask, I mean, which is worse, that that there would be a hell and a heaven afterwards, or that there would be nothing, that there would be no form of justice at the end of time, that there would be no form of reconciliation at the end of time, but that it would just be an end. So someone could live any kind of life they wanted to and there's nothing at the end of it that really reconciles those things. And so the issue of not wanting to burn in hell also comes from this idea of I, I'm, I'm worried about who, you know, my family members. I'm worried about the people around me and this, this compassion that we have towards other people. And that's a very good thing. And so in some ways, it kind of works the other way as well. It works, you know, is if I'm not living a perfect life, I'm not going to hell because there's nothing at the end of time anyway. And so it, it just it just becomes a, a complex issue when it's really a very simple you know a, a very simple issue as far as whether it exists or not. And so the acceptance of of you know the acceptance of God to kind of protect myself from the the fear of what happens next. So one of the things that comes up, and I'll I'll answer this one. Uh, Darwin, evolution, the Big Bang have disproved uh, the need for God. And I think some people are surprised when we say as Catholics that you can believe in evolution. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that that's a scientific, uh, obviously it's a scientific theory, so we wouldn't make a scientific claim. Um, now, sci scientists, are, you know, like Dawkins, are very, very comfortable making religious or philosophical claims, which, you uh -huh. know, I, I, I would contest that. Um, but so, so as a description of what has happened of natural selection or what has happened as far as the Big Bang or the formation, you know, the, of, of stars and galaxies and supernovas. Um, that actually, what's interesting, the Big Bang comes from, you know, uh, the philosophy or the science of it comes from a, a Catholic priest, Georges Lemaitre, who, um, who understood like that we're, uh, you know, the universe comes from something that we're not self-creating. Einstein um, even questioned him. Absolutely, and actually, yeah. Yeah, he he had to correct Einstein's uh, theory because Einstein believed that you know that the universe has always existed, right. so um, was you know, didn't believe in the expanding universe. So being able to engage in those questions that our faith is 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 part of that, but recognizing too that, that praise God there are limits to science, and no no scientist lives purely scientifically, like no one does. We all we all live with love and poetry and art and all sorts of other ways of experiencing truth. You know that you know. Can you scientifically prove, Doug, why you love your wife? Can you scientifically prove why why, why you love your family? It's like, no. You can observe it, and you can be like, well, you know, I say this many nice things a day. You know, but but that's that's not the why. And there's deeper questions that all of us ask. And so that Darwin evolution, none of those things disprove our faith. None of those things. Now, when I try to reduce all reality to scientific theories or scientific knowledge. I'm not only left without faith, I'm left without meaning, I'm left without purpose, I'm left without beauty and art and goodness and transcendence and all those things that I think are, are, are essential for our humanity. So it, it really is a sad way of living and, and I'd, I'd, I'd much rather take my, my life of faith that also has well, science rather than having this that, life of science that doesn't have yeah, faith. Yeah, I mean, right? I'm jumping off that point. I, I love a uh, quote from G.K. Chesterton. Uh, who is a, as you guys know, but for those who are watching, G.K. Chesterton, prolific author in the early 1900s. Uh, G.K. Chesterton said, the saddest thing about being an atheist is the fact that they have no one to thank. And so like, <laughs> but, but think about that for yeah. a moment. I mean, yeah. what Chesterton's getting at is that what happens in my life is not accidental, it's not a cosmic accident of, of chaos, but that actually there is someone who has benevolently gifted me, and therefore this, as a reciprocal response, brings about thanksgiving and th thus joy. Mm -hmm. But if you have no one to thank, uh, at the end of the day, and maybe you can thank your parents for obviously various things they gave you, and so like there's a, there's a certain level, but thanksgiving is still limited to just like something which is passing away, and that's why like Solomon, going into the same thing in the scriptures, says, uh, vanity of vanities, everything is vain. Like this, this kind of, as he, now he's not talking about like it's vain in the physical sense, he's talking about meaningless. Nothing has meaning because Solomon, Solomon still did not know Christ. 
Yeah. Right? There still is the, the missingness of Christ within Solomon's experience. That's where like the, the patriarchs were hoping and like this, the human heart hopes for meaning, hopes for something like we hope for meaning beyond death. We hope to make a lasting impact. We also like it's, it's in lasting impact that we also find like gratitude and joy, which is unending. Mm -hmm. But if there's if there is no God, yeah. like at the end of the day, there ultimately is no one to ultimately thank, which is like a, it's a very sad um, experience. Like the, there would be atheists obviously who would probably disagree with me on that, but I still I would still find that to be a very sad. Like Chesterton says, the sad thing about being an atheist, yeah. there is no one to thank. And he was yeah. an atheist for a while. He too. was. Yeah, so, he was. So, so yeah. yeah. So he, he but the dichotomy you were experience. talking about between science and religion, and and you know that, that there's an intersect there where you have to leave one for the other. Um, you know, we're, studies are showing, peace studies are showing that you know. People that, that children are leaving their faith as early as 10 and 13 years old. And if you think about it, that's around the time they're being introduced to science, the, the, the creation of the world, where the world came from, how it came into existence. And so what happens is, is, is children are learning in, in church that Adam and Eve and learning, you know, from the book of Genesis, and this is the way the world was created. And then they get here to what seems, you know, what is hard facts. And there's a, there's a dichotomy between these two. And so the explanation that needs to be taken place falls, the onus falls on us as Christians and as Catholics Absolutely. in our home. Yeah. In, in, you know, as they're going, especially if they're going to public school, that when they come home, that there's a, a that we need to have our stuff together well enough where we can make this connection for them to show them that not only is it not incongruent, but it's congruent with the understanding of the way God created the world. I think that's that's so important that so often we, that people leave the church, leave religion, leave belief in God. A lot of times, let's be honest, for very good reasons. Yeah. For intellectual reasons, for moral reasons, for reasons of suffering and pain, the problem of evil. But I think the thing we haven't done a good job of is recognizing that all those reasons, we as a church, we've been engaging with those for a very long time. Yeah. And so, so in a sense, if you're starting to question, if you're starting to, like, that's great. That, and you're part of yeah. a long tradition of this in Catholicism, Christianity, in Judaism, in philosophy that we've been engaging with. So, so we welcome those questions and, and those challenges. We don't just say, like, well, don't, don't even think about it. Don't, right. don't question it. Maybe that's unfortunately how, how the faith has sometimes been conveyed or taught is it is just a blind faith. It has nothing to do with re reason, but we always say that faith and reason must be held in intention well, together. And, yeah. But also going to like the Jewish notion of like to struggle, like what Israel means, like Israel, Jacob who was renamed Israel after he wrestled with God, after he struggled with God. And so like struggling with, the beautiful thing about the book of Psalms, which like one third of the book, of, at least one third to one half of the book of Psalms is the book of complaining. Yeah. Uh, the book of Job, which is like Job struggling with these, very mm. difficult questions and having Job who has three three friends who come and give him three bad answers to the question of suffering. <laughs> yeah. And Job is like, no, your, your three answers suck. They, they're, they're terrible <laughs> answers and they don't work. And that's why like at the end of the book when God comes in and actually punishes his three friends for giving three bad answers, these three trite answers to the question of suffering. But Job, Job never really gets an answer to the question of suffering. But the whole point being is that Job struggles and continues to stay like David in the book of Psalms. David struggles and suffers and stays in relationship with God and struggles and wrestles with God, which is like Jacob who wrestles with God. God actually delights in wrestling with us as we try to answer these hard and difficult questions. And that's why like the struggle with these questions, but the problem is when we start taking simplistic, um, trite answers out. Well, I, it's not easy, an easy answer, therefore God doesn't exist. Right. Or it's not an easy answer, like we're, and that's the strange thing, which I find is kind of a contradiction between modern atheism or new atheism, is this notion is like, I'm willing to accept the complexity of the universe. I'm willing to look yeah. at quantum theory and quantum yeah. mechanics. I'm willing to look at like- Quantum reality. Quantum reality, well. yeah. things like that. Yeah. I'm willing to accept that the universe is complex, and yet I'm not willing, I want simplistic answers to these complex questions, such as like, why do people suffer? Like that is, a, it's a simple question, right? But I can also ask in simple questions in, in astrophysics right. that require complexity. Like that's like the complexity is also where you find beauty. Like we know that in, in science, we know that in complexity of the earth and the complexity of the, of the universe, that there's great beauty. And also sometimes in the complexity of these answers, which people are like, no, it should be simple. 
no, not always. Yeah. And we know that, that's, but that's not a sign of irrationality. That's a sign of rationality. Yeah. Right. That makes sense. Well, sure. well and maybe uh, we can look at this, this last point here and then kind of kind of wrap up and just, just think about um, our own response to this as Catholics. Um, this question that does get brought up, and again, I think it's a good challenge that if God's all powerful, then he's either, he's either um, you know, what is it, evil, he's impotent, or he's imaginary. God's either evil, impotent, or imaginary because of suffering in the world, a child dying of cancer, something terrible that we've all experienced as, as priests, as, as members of our family that we've experienced in a sense, meaningless suffering. That's what Job is struggling with as well. So in the face of that, what, what, is, what is our answer? What, what is our, and is it gonna be a satisfying answer? So I'm, I'll put that before you guys. I've got, got my own thoughts, thoughts on it as well. I mean, because to me, God's answer to Job is not satisfying. No, he says, "Gird no. up your loins now, Job, like a man, because I'm going to answer you." And God's, yeah, God's where, answer is, "Where are you in a creative you think you are. Yeah. yeah, and which is that to me is an interesting yeah. response. Like, where you know, where were you when I made the stars? Yeah. Like this, like how could you possibly think that your understanding, your insight on this small moment of time, as as deep and profound as that suffering is, would be able to comprehend it? But that you know, we can still struggle with that and say, that, "Well, that, that's not sufficient." But to me, ultimately, the answer is going to come when God becomes part of his creation, and God experiences suffering. God experience, yeah. takes all that upon himself on the cross. So in a sense, there's a relational answer to this, to this, uh, this moral, intellectual, um, existential crisis of the problem of suffering. Right, and there's also a, a, an, an into it as well in the sense of, um, you know, the, the promise, again, not necessarily satisfying, but can be, um, is that, you know, at the end of time, these things will be reconciled, that, that we will have somewhat of an understanding of how it happened, why it happened, you know, and, and how that affected us and what, what good was brought from it. I mean, and I think sometimes it cheapens it to say, you know, when you're talking to someone and something bad happened, and they're like, well, God's doing it for a reason, you know? And you're oh, like, yeah, gosh, yeah. Ooh, man, that is not what you want to tell someone. Can we just tell people, don't say me. that. Yeah, yeah, don't yeah. Say please that don't people. say that. Yeah, yeah please yeah. don't say that. Or, or he had a good reason for it. Right. Oh my gosh. Right. I mean, you know, it's one of the worst things you can say. Well, uh, uh, yeah. let me let me jump into your into yeah. yours because I'll just say from personal experience, uh, I remember being like in the midst of uh, my my parents got divorced in my little my teenage years, as I think that that's a very common experience, unfortunately, for many people in the world today. Because at this point, the divorce rate in, among Christians as well is no different. Very di no no difference between that um, and secular uh, non religious people. So. Going through like my, my teenage years, like I wondered, I had these questions as well. It's like, is is God impotent? Is God not there? Is God, um, is God real? I I didn't really struggle so much with. I didn't believe that God was not real, because I did. I looked out and I looked at the universe and I was like, causality. And that's what's even in my fifteen year old brain. It's like everything had to come from somewhere, yeah. and that's where if you trace it back long enough, which I didn't know material cause and efficient causality and. That's what I learned in college. But still, I looked at my 15-year-old brain, I was just like, okay, everything had to come from somewhere. But I didn't know was God personal mm -hmm. because I'd not had it up until, like at, up until that point in my life at 15. I'd not had a, I could not recognize that I'd had a personal encounter with God. And then two, it was like, was he a benevolent God or was he an abusive? Like, mm. was he abusive? Did he allow abuse? Was he impotent? Was he allowing the abuse and the evils and sufferings to occur in the world? Or was he actually the cause of them? Like, yeah. which goes to like Even worse. That, yeah. that, those trites, those trite answers. Oh, God, God has, God did this for a reason. I was like, well, then God is evil. Yeah. If God allows, <laughs> right. if God allows this person that I see on TV to get raped, or if mm -hmm. God allows like a tsunami to hit South, uh, Southern Asia yeah. and wipe out two hundred thousand people, if God is the source of this and He is the cause of this, I was like, then God, I agree with the atheists. That God is evil, and I, and I want nothing to do with that God. This was my fifteen-year-old as I was trying to grapple with the question of evil. Um, and that's actually for, for several years in my high school years, like I uh, intellectually, I still went to church because I didn't want to deal with my mom. <laughs> as I think young, so many young Catholic uh, teenagers, like yeah. you have your mom or your dad, they force you to go to church. And I was just like, I didn't want to fight with them. So I just went to church, but I didn't necessarily believe. It wasn't until I was, and it was the question of evil that kept me for about three years that I had wanted nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with God, nothing to do with faith, nothing to do with religion. And it wasn't until, though, I was 18 and I had my first personal encounter with God. And it was in the context of community, of uh, my first real encounter with authentic Catholic community. I was with the Emmanuel community in, uh, 
Italy at that time because I was a, I had volunteered. But it was in that context of community that I had my first encounter with God, first through community and then in a personal moment of prayer where I opened myself up in honesty and vulnerability. And I asked God in that moment as I had that and God and I was speaking with God in prayer. And I, I asked God, I was like, where have you been? Where, why are you allowing all these things to happen? Mm -hmm. I was like, and I had my a Job moment where like it was not pretty yeah. because I was honest and authentic in that, especially with my struggle. And I was like, God, why did you allow all this to happen? Why are you allowing evil and suffering to happen in the world? And what I received in prayer in that moment, which I truly believe was the voice of God, and that's what changed my life and why I'm wearing a collar to this day, is that God told me, he said, Tommy, you can't understand right now. He's like, but I am trying to save everyone. That's what I received. He's like, you can't see how all the pieces. He's like, you want answers to things that you can't understand right now. But what I received in that moment of prayer is that stay with me and in time you will understand. But right now you don't have the capacity to understand the question that you're asking. Hmm. Um, but there was a, actually, for me, there was a great sense of hope because it wasn't just like, you just have to accept this with blind faith that I'm, that I'm benevolent and I love you. It was, just, it was also... And then in my encounter, it was this, this unfolding that with time, I would understand. I would say actually with time, I'm slowly growing and still growing in that understanding. But that's where I'm saying it's, the, it's an encounter with God which transformed my life. And I, I think that's a huge part of this that oftentimes doesn't really get acknowledged because we kind of reduce this to like ethics, like whether you can be good without God or whether and that, that's kind of where a lot of the new atheists... But God didn't come, you know, our understanding of Christianity is God didn't enter into this world, suffer, die on the cross, be raised from the dead, pour out his Holy Spirit, just so we could, like, have a list of rules to follow. Right. Like, you know, just behavior right. modification. We already had that. It's this, it's this <laughs> yeah. transformation that we're, be, you know, this, that we become participant, you know, participate in the divine nature, as, as, as First Peter says. You know, so, like, like recognizing this, this transformation that only comes from an encounter with God. I've actually used that in a conversation before where someone's struggling with faith. I'm like, how do you know God exists? And I said this, I'm like, well, you know, in addition to all the philosophical reasons of, of you know, uh, first cause and all these different things that you, you, you can um, you get, a, uh, you know, the contingency of the universe. I've met him. I've met God. I've met God in prayer. Him. And and that's something, not some, that's not a relationship that I control. I don't manipulate it. It's I'm subject to it. I'm, but I, I've encountered that infinite love for me that's overwhelming that I can't generate. If I could generate, I would do it all the time. Sure. You know, whenever people are like, oh, yeah. you're, you're just, you were just imagining things like, oh, shoot, I would imagine that every single day. <laughs> if, I, if, I could, yeah. if I could just kind of generate in my mind, oh, infinite love and warmth and mercy and tenderness, you know, I would, I would always do that. But most of my prayer is not that. Right. But it's, I, it, it's rooted in those experiences and those encounters as well. And I think that is not negligible, not something that we, we, encounter, we engage with too often in our conversations with people maybe who are struggling with faith. Yeah, and, and, and then, you know, you were talking about a satisfying answer. And, and I mean, I, I think sometimes we're, we're looking for a conclusive answer rather than for a satisfying answer because there's yeah. lots of things in our life that's not conclusive. I, I mean, it's hard to tie up loose ends, especially when we're talking about something that's much bigger than we are and something that we can't understand and we can't know. I mean, the, the idea, you know, the idea always against atheists is, is to say, you know, you can't have knowledge of the complete universe and be able to say that there isn't a God. And so in this same way, I mean, you, you can reduce that to this, this problem of evil as well. Is I don't know all the circumstances. I don't know how this could be used. I don't know why this would have happened. And so because I don't know, it's one way, it, you know, it turns in a couple of different ways. And one way is to turn, since I don't know, then it has to be meaningless. Mm -hmm. As opposed to just because I don't know what the cause of this was or why it happened, doesn't mean that it has to be meaningless. It may just mean that I can't see the meaning yet and I may not ever see it. Well, I think that also in that, like it's it's the approach, it's, it's your very approach to life itself. Do I approach life through the lens of humility or do I approach it through the lens of, uh, of arrogance? And like, that's also like distinguishing also with like atheism between the atheist and the agnostic, I think is also important in this, in this regard. Cause I know many people who may, might call themselves atheists, but practically speaking, they're agnostic. And that's like, Understanding those terms, which is that atheism, which is no God, I, and therefore is making a statement of fact, like that there is not a God. And therefore, the difference between an atheist and agnostic, an atheist makes a claim to knowledge, makes a claim to that this knowledge disproves the existence of God, or this fact disproves the existence. So there's a truth claim by the atheist versus the agnostic, which means agnosis, no knowledge. So from because that's where you get the Greek is a no. 
knowledge, gnos, gnosis, knowledge. So a gnost, the agnostic says, I don't know. It's the shrug. Yeah, it's like the shrug. shrug emoji. Now, the, 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 <laughs> yeah. is like sometimes when you get the agnostic, it's like, ah, I don't know and I don't really care. Right, um, right. Versus you have many, I know many, many people who might identify as agnostic, but they're just like, I don't have evidence. And, but there's, there can be a humility in that versus there's the difference between that who says there is, the, this piece of scientific evidence disproves the existence of God. So I think that there's a, a difference in the, in the approach of how people, as well as kind of a conflation of the terms. So the contention that people say that religion is not evidence-based, that people just be believe it with blind faith, how, how would you respond to that? I think that's true with some people. Some people, they were taught it by their parents, and therefore that's just what they believe. Uh, I think that that is a, a false argument because to say that it's not uh, reason-based, like I can give you tons, and like we've been talking kind of in the, in this, in the show, tons of philosophical uh, reasons, which are sound reasons following the rules of logic, that these are sound reasons for why I believe in the existence of God. So to say that it's not reason-based is a complete scarecrow of thousands of years of both pagan and Judeo-Christian philosophers who have given great reasons. You might straw not straw man, you mean? Yeah, yeah, straw man. Thank sorry. you. <laughs> sorry, scarecrow, straw man. That's good enough. Good, big up uh, with the straw man. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's yeah. a complete straw man. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's a complete straw man argument because you have two thousand years plus of good reasoning from theologians as well as philosophers, some pagan, some not, um, some Judeo-Christians as well, that who basically give them good reasons. The problem that many people have is the presupposition that it has to be scientifically based. Right. It has to be, you have to have a lab coat you when have you to say have, it. Yeah, yeah. It has, yeah, it's a materialistic argument that unless you can give me matter, but that's the thing is like, science can only evaluate matter. Like it, it's, philosophy is something else and that's to say that to say that you can't give a good reason for the existence of God is to throw out the entire school of philosophy. And I think that's a good point to say that that might be true for some people, but that doesn't therefore make the case. It doesn't beg the question or beg, beg, beg the case that because some people just say, I just believe it, the Bible says that I believe it, you know, that that, that means that it's, it's true for everybody. Because we do, we have the 2,000 years of Christi Christianity, the 5,000 years of, of, <laughs> of Judeo-Christianity, yeah. plus the whole, you know, uh, there, there's a lot behind it that lends it, the reason for our faith. I think it's also interesting that people say, oh, well, look at all, like, atheism is growing. Like, if you actually look at the world statistics, 90% of people in the world today, if you put together, believe in some type of deity, some type of higher power, some type, actually the, the, the growth, there, is a, there has been some growth in atheism, but actually across the board, if you look at all cultures, most human beings actually do believe in the existence of some type of spiritual being or some type of higher power and things like that. So like, and that's, to, to throw out and to say that there's no reason behind all of these different, like that's just, I would say it's incongruent. So we're gonna, we're gonna there's a lot more that we could say about this. And I think for, for us, maybe just thinking about the answer to this question, is there one book or one author or one saint or one piece of art or one, one idea that you would encourage somebody to check out if they're, if they're struggling with faith, if they're struggling with theism, with believing in God, uh, believing in Christianity, if they're, they're tempted towards atheism. So putting that out there, the thing that I, I would put forward is, uh, is mere Christianity. Ah, uh, you still not. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, well, mere Christianity, again, so we it's- we gotta come up with it's, something it's, other than that? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so I, I wanted to take that first. Uh, C.S. Yeah. Lewis, who, who was an atheist, who um, was an academic, brilliant man, um, who encountered, you know, and encountered God and became a believing Christian, has some amazing uh, accounts of it. But, but mere Christianity is a, is a great place to go. If you want to say that you've struggled with your Christianity and decided to leave it, don't leave Christianity, Catholicism behind without going through mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. You have to go through a lot of stuff for, for, I mean, you stole mere Christianity, so I mean, but. Uh, <laughs> That's right, I'm having to think here. Yeah, but, you know, I would say that's though. That's uh, coming to my mind. I mean, if, if a person is uh, is looking for more greater death, especially philosophical, like they, they want to really de delve into the philosophy as well as like, how is it rational? Uh, I'd say Plato and Aristotle. Plato and Aristotle, who are both pagans, who both, both without any exposure to Christianity, both came to an understanding that if there is a God, then he is one. If there is a God, then therefore there's the certain philosophical truths that they came through. Just using pagan philosophy to deduce and to induce that there seems to be that if there's a God, there's certain attributes of the prime mover. And so like, that's why like uh, many of the early Christians called uh, Plato uh, the proto-Christian because he, yeah. like, he was making arguments for the existence of God prior to his exposure to any type of, at least as far as we know, any theistic model.
Um, the one of the the books that I would say pick up and, and be able to read is Edward Fazer's book on the five proofs or the five ways of, of Thomas Aquinas of coming to the uh, understanding of how the world was created, why it was created, the causality of it, and just the rationality of it. Yeah, and that's important. So I'm I'm going to give one more as a bonus to you guys. Uh, read the Gospel of John. Yeah. If you've never read the, if you're thinking about, you know, I don't believe in my, that that faith my my youth. Open up the Gospel of John, read it, and ask that question. Jesus, if you're real, reveal yourself to me. I mean, that, that, that we, we believe God is real and that he, had, he has, has something to say about this. So you can do that with any of the Gospels. Uh, so, guys, thanks so much for this conversation today about atheism. Hopefully it was helpful to you. Thank you for all those who have been supporting us, and we'll see you next time here on Catholic in America. 